the cord on this. So today's workshop is um, obviously on finding other resources. And like I said, before I hit record, um, Holly and I are here to help folks with um, any of their grant writing needs for ARAC or for other resources, because at the end of the day, we have a lot of you know funds that we offer at ARAC, but they're also, some of them can be very competitive. And so um, sometimes it's not a matter of scoring super well, it's just like, we don't have enough funds to fund everybody who's awesome. And so- um, The worst part. Yes. That's the worst part of our jobs. So we're like, well, let's find other ways. I'm Holly. I'm the director of outreach uh, or grants and outreach. And um, as I said earlier, I'm coming to you from my bedroom because my dogs are far too needy. So that's the most professional, but it's quiet. Yeah. And then I guess we could be a little interactive here because we've got a little bit more people. But if you feel like, you know, you want to share maybe um, where you're tuning in from in the chat and also maybe the art medium that you practice, that would be cool to share to get an idea of what to focus on today. Um, I realize we probably should have disclaimers on some of these. I am coming to you as an artist and um, I have a lot of my own personal views and maybe they're not always the, um, what is the terminology you're supposed to use? A reflection of um, the organization, the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council. A lot of this is my experience as an artist um, and also sharing some resources that I've come across, which is a, a lot. <laughs> so hopefully folks find it helpful and I'm kind of just like, at the end, um, I'll kind of hand over a whole list of all the different grant resources there are just in our region um, alone. And hopefully you guys can start to go out there and get money for your projects. <laughs> um, and for my background, I'm a visual artist. So I do um, mostly painting and public art, um, but I also work as a freelance graphic designer. I've gotten into film and animation more recently. Uh, so I dabble in a lot of different visual mediums and have written a lot of grants to get paid to do those things. So um, kind of an overview of what today we'll, we'll be going over, um, what types of funding there are, uh, how to choose, uh, and then also where to look, and then what to have prepared and how to organize um, just generally for um, when you're looking for grants to have ready. Um, and then at the end, I'll share my little list of funders. And I'll pass this part over to Holly because um, she's got a lot more experience talking about the legacy amendment, but we live in Minnesota, most of us here. And so um, it's a very special place for arts and arts funding. And Holly, you want to take that away? <laughs> well, thanks. Um, yeah, I talk about it a lot. Um, prior prior to my first convention with the grant makers in the arts, um, I didn't even realize just how amazing things were. But we have a program in Minnesota and it's part of the, the legacy funds amendments. Um, so everybody, it, it's a fraction of a percent of money that comes from taxes through the state and it's wrapped up in conserving water and um, uh, developing arts and having them available to every Minnesotan. And um, it has been, shoot, now I can't remember since when, but it's 25 year. And um, going to other places or other states, it's amazing. They think we are just rock stars. There is literally another state that has this kind of support for their artists. So it is a very good thing to live in Minnesota. Um, if you're talking with your artist friends, there are 11 regional arts uh, councils in Minnesota. So if your artist friends don't know about it, let's say, you know, they're over in Bemidji, they have a, a really good grants program over there, or, you know, someone in the city, have them look up their local rack and get involved with what they have to offer. But it's, it's wonderful. We're very, very fortunate. Yeah, and that money is... So for the arts, right, it goes through the Minnesota State Arts Board and then the, the regional arts councils. Those are kind of the two, two places to be on the lookout for as far as where to get access to that Minnesota specific funding, correct? Right, and if you go to Minnesota, 
Minnesota Arts Board website, they have a little state of Minnesota and you can hit any region. They have the all 11 and it'll bring you a link right there. Sweet. All right, this is pulling from one of my earlier um, presentations, but it works for everything uh, as far as like the types of funding that are out there. Um, I think as far as like who can receive funding, it kind of breaks down to individual artists. So like you as a person, as a human being without any sort of, you know, um, business necessarily tied to that, um, just as a sole proprietor or things of that nature. And then um, organizations, or if you're an individual and you're applying to an organization grant in some capacity, usually you have a fiscal sponsor who's a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and I kind of break down um, the types of funding that are out there between funding for projects and funding for non-projects. Um, basically a project is anything with a start to finish. You can see on this list here um, that, you know, things that fall in that category are exhibits, films, albums, books, any art medium output, um, including the supplies or the equipment tied to any of those outputs, um, events, funds to host events, classes, research or apprenticeships, travel costs. Um, and then I have fellowships in both categories because uh, for like a, a project fellowship, usually the funder wants you to complete some sort of research or a project. I think Forecast Public Arts has a, a research fellowship um, that they have every year, I think, where it's, um, they're looking at like racial equity issues uh, in public art. And so they um, will select people to do a research project around that. Um, and then non-projects include, you know, equipment or supplies generally. Um, so for instance, I, back when AROC did have a tech and equipment grant, um, I had one supplied to get an iPad, which I used to you make up, make mock-ups of public art. Um, and so I wrote the grant just specifically saying, I need this piece of equipment and it will help me further my career in these amount of ways or in these specific ways. And so I, I, the money basically went towards funding that piece of equipment and that equipment alone, um, not necessarily the projects associated with it. Um, emergencies, especially during COVID, I think there was a lot more like emergency type grants or during like nat natural disasters. Um, I've seen grants kind of pop up from different foundations. Um, when you're paying for help or general services, so I've written a lot of grants to like sort of subcontract with folks or to um, hire people to help me with things when I don't have time or to, um, I've written grants to pay interns, things like that, uh, to update my website. Um, sometimes folks will offer, um, you know, sometimes you can write grants to pay your rent or just pay for costs associated with living. Um, and then fellowships on this side is usually when the funder wants to pay you for being you. So I think of, um, I guess a lot of the, you know, there's like the Bush Fellowship or some of the McKnight Fellowships where it's kind of like you get a huge cash amount of prize of like, you know, twenty five to one hundred thousand dollars for just you as an individual. And they kind of work up a plan with you to do public speaking, um, different engagements like that. And there's not really a project tied to it because it's usually that money is supposed to pay for your whole year of existing as an artist. <laughs> How to choose, here's some things to consider when you're looking, uh, oh, I forgot to put, fill in that last bullet point, but here's some things to consider when you're looking at um, different funders and funding opportunities. Um, I talk a lot about ethics because it comes up for me, especially as an artist who does a lot of activism. Um, and so knowing where you know the funding is coming from so, you know, with the, like the state arts board and the regional arts councils, for the most part, you know, that money is coming from that legacy amendment, um, which is taxpayers and stuff like that. But then when you get into the territory of like foundations, a lot of foundations are basically, you know, run by corporations that are getting tax write offs. And so making sure that, you know, if you're not, um, like if you're an artist who's trying to do, I don't know, um, activism in your art against, pipelines or something and the foundation is run by an oil, oil company 
you know, it's not like that becomes a major controversy for people who don't know, but it might, you know, be a point of tension for you in your, your career if you get bigger. Um, also looking at like the missions of different foundations um, and then kind of like a bureaucracy, I guess, because obviously like for spaces like the National Endowment for the Arts or a lot of like national um, foundations and funders, I feel like there's a little bit more bureaucracy and sometimes like you kind of have to decide if it's worth it to pursue those opportunities when there might be just more red tape in the application process and there might be more time to, to spend um, filling out the actual grant. Um, and I think that's a conversation that's happening within those spaces too about how to reduce those barriers, but sometimes they're, they're just barriers. Um, yeah, consider like what your status is in, as an artist. So I think foundations are kind of getting away from using like emerging and um, young leader or, or things like that to describe their fellowships and, and um, grant applications and things like that. Um, but it's good to kind of look around and see um, how, how foundations are, I guess, categorizing people um, for their opportunities. And then I always encourage people to just look at artists that you follow or artists whose work is similar to yours and see, like, do a little digging and see what sort of awards that they've gotten in the past, because it might be kind of in a similar vein to what you want to get. Um, Holly, is there anything else you would think of for how to choose? This mm. <laughs> the only the only thing I would say, you know, because you can Google things online and stuff and you want to be wary of any place that requires a fee Ooh, yeah. to be part of it. Um, you want to avoid those or, or if they're an excessive fee. Um, so just kind of, you know, our foundations and sometimes, you know, Better Business Bureau is a really nice place to just see if there's been complaints about an organization. And, but yeah, mostly I would say, you know, watch out for any entry fees. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a grant where you had to pay for it ever. So, um. mm, well, yeah, I don't, you know, it's one of those things where they are, it's weird what they come up with and they, um, the exploitation it reminds me of your other, mm -hmm. but, and really look at eligibility, I think you know, where you are. So that's where you would find like where if you're emerging or established or, um, and look, you know, time frames. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely look at those boring. I consider boring details. Boring <laughs> details are important. Before, yeah. Before Read the boring at guidelines. <laughs> It'll tell you a lot. <laughs> There's been so many times where I've looked at opportunities and, you know, I'll start like working on the application and then I wouldn't have read through the eligibility and it'll have like a geogra geography restriction right of like only artists living in this county or this um specific geography are allowed to apply to this and then i'm like oh well shoot <laughs> i should have read that we do starting <laughs> we do that i feel a lot of inquiries from other states and other things where they're like or i feel horrible when someone submits a grant and they put all that time into it and it's like well you don't qualify because you have to live here Right. So as far as where to look, and I think, you know, this presentation might be a little bit shorter on as far as me talking, because I feel like um, we might take the end to just go into some of the actual grant websites. Um, but some things to keep in mind as far as like where to find grants. My favorite place is, and, and like early on in my career, I was like obsessed with doing this, but I love looking at like the back of brochures or printed programs, because when you think about it, at, um, especially for like events that get funding, they kind of are required in a lot of their contracts to put, you know, a mention of who sponsored or who funded the event, especially for arts events. And so usually you'll find that on the back or, you know, in the, um, somewhere inside the, the brochure or program. Um, and back in the day, I would just like write down all of the places in the little spreadsheet. And then I, you know, Google them when I got home to see if they had other opportunities or to see like what it would take to actually get funded by them. Um, and that's the same with like the bottom of websites. So usually, you know, if you're not looking at it in a paper form, 
generally funders and sponsors are found at the bottom of different websites. So um, also on social media. So a lot of artists, if it's an individual artist, they generally try and credit um, different sponsors and social media posts. Uh, so again, really looking to artists or people whose work is maybe similar to yours and seeing um, what kind of funding opportunities they got um, and doing that research. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think at events, sometimes, you know, foundations and, and places will be tabling. So maybe again, finding events that are relevant to the field that you're working in. Um, newsletters and listservs are amazing. Uh, and maybe if you don't want to have like a million and one different newsletters coming to your email, maybe just make a separate email for all of those to go. Um, and then, you know, like anytime you go on that email that there's going to be some kind of opportunity or updated in your, your artistic field. Uh, and if you're a part of like listservs, which I think are more like, I don't even know what listservs are. I just know that there's some through UMD that I've seen um, that have afforded me some really cool opportunities. They're like networks of people who email each other um, different news listings. And so um, definitely subscribe to newsletters because that also is when you're going to be like the first in the know to different workshops for grants you might want to pursue, um, updates to grant programs, deadline reminders, all sorts of things come through email. Um, Facebook and social media groups. So there's lots of arts groups out there. Uh, it kind of depends on who's running it. Um, I'm trying to think. So for native artists, when I worked at the American Indian Community Housing Organization, we started a group that's kind of like a close uh, network of people who exhibited at ECO. And we always share like different opportunities and as far as like grants and requests for proposals and basically anything that requires some kind of application, um, we will share it there. So maybe if the social media group doesn't exist on Facebook for you, you could start one with your peers or people like you and um, in your art field and see, I don't know, network, <laughs> see what happens. That's kind of what we did at ECO and it's become a really great resource for our little art community. Um, there's a lot of websites. Uh, I've really, I've actually never used grants.gov, but I, I know a lot of people who recommend it. Um, I don't know that the user interface is as friendly as some other spaces. Uh, I'll share at the end, Springboard for the Arts has an amazing, like really thorough uh, grants list on their website. Submittable uh, is kind of like a space with a mix of like job applications and magazine submission spots and grants and all sorts of things. And so again, if you're looking to submit a lot of, um, you know, poets use it for like submitting poetry to different journals or things like that. Um, there's a lot of grant funders who actually use Submittable and then have submitted applications through. And it's kind of nice because you create an account there and then you can browse stuff, um, save applications that are interesting to you. And then um, it has like a dashboard where you can keep track of like where you've been accepted or not. Um, and then Creative Capital has a really cool newsletter that you can subscribe to. And like every month or two, they have this huge list of artist residencies, requests for proposals, like nationwide um, grant applications. Um, highly recommend submitting to that. And I think at the end of this, I'll link to this slideshow. And at the end of the slideshow, there's a bunch of links you can actually click on. So all of this will be provided <laughs> towards the end of this. Um, um, I'll, before I forget to Artwork Archive, their yeah. art blog, they sell um, software for organizing your arts or, cate you know, um, not categorizing, but inventory and things like that, kind of how to manage your art world. But you can sign up, you get a free newsletter from them. They have some really good guides and the they're great for inspiration, but they do a uh, kind of a national grants dump once a month as well. That's the one I was trying to, I guess Creative Capital does that too. There's a lot of folks, but oh uh, yeah. If you want to put the Artwork Archives link in the chat too, that would be cool. But I just dropped the link to this 
um, slideshow for folks who want to just download it, save it, whatever. Um, I think everything should be clickable at the end of this. Um, yeah, festival. So for film folks, you know, like we had the North by North Film Festival recently here in Duluth, and they had a pitch competition where you could pitch your idea in front of a panel of professionals in the field. And um, they awarded a $2,500 prize in different categories for people to just start their films. Um, and I think that's a, a practice kind of in the film genre that I'm, I've learned about recently. Um, you can ask staff, you can ask me or Holly or people who work at different, you know, philanthropic foundations, um, what their connections are, what they've heard is, is taking place in the funding world and what to be aware of um, as far as grants coming out. And also ask your peers, again, a lot of this is just checking in with other artists and generally people are willing to share. Um, Artists have a lot of different personalities, so, you know, might not always be the case, but uh, for the most part, I think people are, are willing to share and be supportive of each other um, for the most part. And then, yeah, reaching out to area foundations and regional funders. As far as what you want to have prepared as you go on this grant searching journey, generally everything for the arts is going to require some kind of artist statement or, or a description of the project that you're working on. Um, you want to make sure that your artist resume is up to date and that's inclusive of all of your volunteer arts experience, all of your time doing anything public in the art world, um, prominent bodies of work or press stories on your work. Um, make sure you've got a short version of your biography and a long version of your biography and that in conjunction with your artist resume is going to be the story of your career. Um, so make it interesting and make it heartfelt and, you know, make it stand out. Again, Holly and I help folks all the time with crafting all of these different materials. So feel free to reach out if you're kind of stuck on any of them. Um, for a specific project, if you're, if you're looking for funding for a project, um, you know, have a full budget with line items uh, of, you know, what's your, your final goal uh, of, of what you want to spend on a project or um, what do you actually need to make something happen? And I just met with someone earlier who, you know, gave me their budget, but then I was like, did you include anything to pay yourself for assembling this whole thing? <laughs> and, and he was like, actually, no. And I was like, well, that might actually be a point to start with. At least for me, a lot of my grants and, and projects start with me paying myself to do the work of writing the grants to get other parts of the project done and organizing the people to get them involved in a public art project or, you know, in a film project, things like that. So make sure like you're thinking about paying yourself because that also, you know, for, for folks who joined on the um, grant writing tips and tricks um, presentation that we had that's also linked on the ARAC website under workshops. Um, I think uh, we kind of talked about all of that. <laughs> so um, always pay yourself. No more starving artists. Even if always calculate your time, even if you are donating it to it, to show them how much time you put in and that shows your value and your worth. And it's a feasibility thing. When we talk about like a lot of funders and, and panels that are reviewing grants are going to look at, you know, a criteria of feasibility. Are you able to accomplish something? And if they see that you're like starving yourself to get this work done and like, you, you know, you don't have um, kind of like a stable base for, for what you're doing, like it sometimes can count against you and, and, you know, panels will see that and just it's always better to include yourself in a budget, I think. So, yes. Um, yeah, uh, think of marketing plans. Like if there's a significant, like uh, this happens a lot with organizations, especially where they'll say like, they wanna reach a specific demographic of BIPOC individuals and all these things. And then they have like zero marketing plan and zero like evidence that they're going to um, actually reach these, pop these new populations for them. And so making sure that if you're trying to do something different or reach people who aren't your same audience, that you've got at least some kind of marketing plan um, or outreach plan written somewhere. 
Um, make sure you got the passion. Why are you excited? And why should people be excited about you? Like, why should they be excited about the work that you're bringing into this world? Um, and then I think, oh, yeah. And then I think um, I, I've been encouraging people too to apply, even if you're not sure if you'll get it, because, you know, having that experience of like going through the process of writing a grant. Um, allows you to have a, a, a body of writing that you can transfer to other grants. So like once you get that first sort of proposal out of the way, you can figure out ways to input that into other um, funding sources. So it's not as daunting, um, but just start, write stuff. <laughs> just, yep, just start writing. Um, as, as I was saying today, just start just word vomit, just word all your stuff out, all your dreams, all your everything, and then build that scaffolding and then save it off to the side. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Woo, stock photos. We all succeed when we all succeed. So I think, um, yeah, I feel like, why did I put this here? I think, especially living for a lot of us who are living up here in more greater Minnesota. Um, it's important to, to encourage each other and try and create environments where it's not like toxicity and, and we're not like being super competitive and what is it the crabs in a barrel analogy and all these things and, and also not functioning with a scarcity mentality um, around the funding that's out there because we if you live in Minnesota, I feel like it's a great privilege being here as an artist, just with all of the resources that we have. Um, and it's important to share those and also to like represent your region, represent and and be advocates when you see stuff that's, you know, like, I, I don't know. I have a lot of issues sometimes with like seeing uh, foundations based in the Twin Cities area and metro area, like um, not sending funds out to greater Minnesota as much. And like, when you see issues like that, issues of equity, um, speak up and also like work with people in your community to speak up because uh, it takes more than I think the one voice to actually make changes to those systems. So just a little reminder that it's great when, you know, all of us up here start getting the Minnesota State Arts Board Awards and getting the McKnight Fellowships and, and things like that. And just to let you all know, I mean, we saw last year a 38% increase in state arts board grants coming into our region. So we are definitely on their radar. And then because of that, we actually, you know, the more that we get from the state, they're like, oh, there's a lot of people there. They need more money. So it's, it, it, it helps everybody. If you get a grant from the state, it helps everybody in our region. Um, and with every grant that you get, it lends you more credibility. Um, and it is, you know, what more is more when we all do better, we all do better. It's not, I mean, I like to say it's not pie. We have certain buckets of money, but it's like, we, we make sure that, that the pie is evenly distributed. <laughs> I should have put a pie here instead of a <laughs> well, it's more kind of like with equity or whatever. I'm like, it's not pie. <laughs> so uh, that kind of concludes the, the talking points, but I might dive into some of these different um, resources and foundations. And again, I put a link to just this whole slideshow with all of these clickable links um, in the chat. And I, I think we can also probably email it out to folks too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mind sharing this, but this i think you can still see stuff so this is that really cool um resource by springboard for the arts that i talked about earlier where it lists the state agency so obviously minnesota state arts board it has links to all of the regional arts councils wherever you are in minnesota um they've got an array of emergency grants which we talked about performing arts visual arts um music so they kind of have stuff broken down by, you know, genres. And then on the side, you can see um, Jerome Foundation. I think they work in Minnesota and New York. It's kind of an interesting mix. Um, they have a lot of different grants. We have McKnight uh, in Minnesota. So they have grants and fellowships for every single 
uh, genre of art, including, I think, you know, they've got the newer community engaged artists fellowship, which I keep applying for, <laughs> and I will continue to apply for, and I keep telling them I hope they will fund somebody in greater Minnesota at some point, because <laughs> it, it has gone, uh, not to talk down about McKnight, but, you know, there has been a lot of metro representation in the individual arts funding, so um, I'd love to see more people out here applying and, and showing that we've got really cool individual artists out here doing amazing stuff and, and telling awesome stories. Um, got forecast public art. Um, they have, I was just seeing there too, I see they have all of the regional racks too. And the link to Springboard is on our, or under our resources tab on the website, just in case you lose sight of any of these things. Because they do, they're they're a wonderful organization, and they're yep. See a second one down. Springboard. Oh yeah, we've got a whole page too. I didn't even know that. Well, we do, but I, I think spring, Springboards is really. I mean, they go deep dive. Yeah, and if you missed previous workshops, we've been recording them and putting them up here, but. Um, yeah, I got a, a forecast emerging artist grant a few years ago, and that was actually one of the that was the start of my public arts career. Um, so definitely recommend reaching out to forecast public art. They do um, different workshops uh, and just the whole a whole bunch of services. Um, I, I mentioned that they have, I think, that research fellowship. Um, and so definitely if you're into public art, subscribe to the newsletter over here. Um, forecast, I think is one of the major names in public arts funding here. And also I feel like we don't have a ton of public art um, funding in the region. I think I talked about this last week, actually. I was gonna put it in the presentation, but um, let's see if I can pull up my website. So uh, for folks who asked about public art last week, this is a project I've been working on for the last few years, and I need to add more funders to it, apparently. Um, <laughs> but I think we had like eight, maybe eight or nine different foundations and, and organizations that funded this because there isn't like a lot of large, just public arts grants here. Um, so that's something I'd like to see you know, change in our, our funding landscape is more um, more funding so you don't have to apply to seven different places and then report to all those places and <laughs> try and fit into everybody's different requirements. Um, but yeah, forecast is definitely the only place I think right now that's on the map funding um, public art. Let's see. And then, yeah, they've got a lot of different, um, I think these are more national national grants. If you go to uh, some of their links are out of date. <laughs> Don't worry, I have the link. Um, sorry, this could get dizzying for a second. <laughs> Just a little meta. Okay, so I put I put star or asterisks by um, resources that consist of like lists. So for, um, that didn't work. Okay, we'll go the old fashioned way, arts and. So for native artists, um, Native Arts and Culture Foundation, uh, they have a list similar to Springboard, only specific to native artists. Um, they have a list of national resources and then native led funders in the United States. Uh, I think, let's see. First People's Fund. Yeah, you can see fellowships through the First People's Fund. There's actually, there's a ton of um, resources for native artists these days. So definitely kind of connect with this space, connect with these resources. Headwaters Foundation for Justice. I know they do a lot of like obviously justice work. So if your work kind of revolves around that, um, this is a really good space to connect with. I think they recently had a 
la la da da. Can I, let's see. This fund I thought was uh, really interesting, and it's around. Um, I think it was. Let's see. Da, da, da. The Black Seed Fund. It's for Black-led organizations, um, and they had a really a really inspiring and interesting uh, application process. For youth, people looking to get funding for youth stuff, Youth Prize is a, a board that I just joined and apparently they fund all over <laughs> Minnesota. So uh, for anything that's youth related, hit up Youth Prize. I think Knight Foundation works out of different cities, um, like select cities around the United States. So I believe Duluth is actually one of the cities and I think St. Paul. Um, I have not, I, I've been funded through them like indirectly, <laughs> but uh, I don't think their outreach in Duluth is as strong as it is in St. Paul. So usually when you see stuff about the Knight Foundation, it's again, related more to Metro. So <laughs> let's get Duluth on the map. Um, and again, all of these statements are from me personally and not from the Arrowhead Regional Arts Council. <laughs> <laughs> Just giving you the inside scoop here. Um, Arts Midwest, they fund the Midwest, obviously. And, and they're a good organization as well. They've got this really cool grant. Um, again, a little bit bureaucratic for the amount of funding that they offer, but I think they're like $2,500 um, for events. So you have to have like two events um, related to the arts and maybe they've increased the amount. So this is if, uh, if you have like a, a specific event that you wanna host. Um, obviously the deadline for that just passed, but usually funders will have like, if, if the deadline has passed, it usually will tell you when the next application will be. And so it's good to have a spreadsheet of some kind or just like a, a calendar where you keep track of like what these deadlines are, when they open, when they close, and um, when your projects can actually start. Jerome Foundation, I've applied to, I've never received. <laughs> I have given up on Jerome. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, but they have really cool film um, grants. Let's see. They also have their artist fellowship. So um, this is one where I think there's an emerging artist fellowship, but I believe, you know, those terms emerging and established are kind of um, not necessarily set in stone because I know of like one artist who I've heard received the Jerome Emerging Artist Fellowship and also received like an established artist fellowship from another foundation in the same year. And so, <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, sometimes I, I think that's where it becomes problematic having those sort of specific labels. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why people are moving away from it. Um, let's see. There was a cool, this was a grant that I got a couple of years ago, 880 cities, emerging art, emerging city champions. It might not be called that anymore because they, oh, it still is. So this is like if your project is um, dealing with like making your city better, better. And I think it's connected with Knight Foundation. So it was through this and Knight Foundation that I got a $2,500 scholarship and a trip to Toronto um, to fund a concert series here in Duluth. Women's Foundation, not specific. Like, so here's the other thing. There's foundations for everything. <laughs> Like I said, so if you're doing a project that is somehow bettering the community and it just so happens to use art or artists, um, there's not really, you know, definitely look into like the populations like you're trying to serve. So I got a grant from the Women's Foundation of Minnesota also to do that same concert series that the Knight Foundation funded one year. And um, it was partly because it, it met the goals of like, there was a component of like women's outreach at domestic violence shelters and things like that. But if there's a way that you can turn your grant into something for social good or to benefit a specific population, 
research places that um, fund that specific population or, or services in those spaces. So like this is, this was it. And this again was like small grant, $2,500 for women 16 and 24, which is really cool. And they had a whole um, space where you could, you know, it was like a cohort basically model. So like every month I kind of had to go down to the city because I was the only one from Duluth <laughs> um, uh, uh, that got selected for a grant or I think even applied for a grant a grant through this. So another space where it, I feel like more representation from greater Minnesota would be cool. And same with Bush Foundation, they give tons of money away. Like these are the big, like if you've got an innovative idea, um, they're pretty pro arts, uh, I would say, um, with what they do, like the, let's see, what was it? They used to have like a, or, a organization grant called Creative Community Cohort. And that was a big prize that went out to like over 50 different organizations around Minnesota, North Dakota and South Dakota and the Native Nations that exist in those spaces. So that's their geographic um, region. And they basically share a lot, of, um, a lot of really big grants for really big ideas. Um, Obviously, the Bush Fellowship is their most, you know, prestigious individual person uh, grant, and I believe it's gone to artists in the past. It's basically anyone who's doing like really important cultural and community work, and that's hundred thousand dollars. I think you can spread across two years, um, and you can either use it as an academic scholarship or um, or just for money, <laughs> you know. So. <laughs> And they used to, on their website, have like scholarships to different conferences and stuff. I think with COVID, they stopped posting those. I don't know if they'll bring them back, but it was really cool because you could su definitely subscribe to their newsletter. Um, and you would get an alert when they would have conferences in like California or um, there was one in like Aspen that was like the Aspen Ideas Fest or something. Um, so really, really cool networking and community connecting opportunities and they, that all expenses paid you travel and, and meet people around the nation. Um, and yeah, let's see. I think, but you know, and once you start looking for these resources as computers do and algorithms and you get more coming at you and keep gathering them, get those emails, um, uh, and, and it'll come easier because you'll find the keywords to search with or, to, you know, it'll guide you along the way. And if you really don't know, like, you know, you can do a project, but you really don't, you know, just looking through and reading what grants are for can spark some inspiration. And you, you know, just without even, you know, like our different project grants and there's, um, you know, there's different levels of grants and you'll become more familiar. Oh yeah, the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation, also good. Also on their board. <laughs> so we are you on? <laughs> on a lot of boards. And so that's why I'm sharing all this. No, Along with being an artist, she is a professional board member. Well, you, you can see I'm very vocal when I see like inequity and stuff in specific foundations or places where money is handed out. So. For me as an artist, like something that I started very early on was just like, if I don't understand something or if I wasn't seeing the results I wanted out of a specific institution with money and power, I would sign up to join them <laughs> and learn what actually is like what conversations are happening behind the scenes. Um, and obviously like organizations are not necessarily people. Now in America, we have corporations are people, but organizations are not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, you know, they change over time, like the Duluth Superior Area or Community Foundation had a really bad portal for a long time. And I felt like they really didn't do a great, you know, job in reaching people in the community because as a resource, like this is all the grants that they have. And they serve, you know, a bunch of affiliates and also Duluth and Superior, which I think it's really important to, you know, 
talk about Superior as part of our community because a lot of the funding that we have through like the State Arts Board and through regional arts councils, it's all like, it can't touch Superior. <laughs> and so this is one of the few resources that actually exists to support at least that part of the community and parts of Wisconsin. Um, and so if you know people who are living in Superior, like definitely forward them to this organization because look at all of this, you know? Um, and there's still, you know, a lot has changed since I've joined the board, not because of me, but because, you know, they have a new executive director and, you know, they switched their grant portal to be, you know, kind of modeled a little bit more after what ARAC uses. And so organizations change. And so if, you know, if you got stung in the past <laughs> by working with one of these institutions, just, you know, it's, it's not a bad thing to revisit because there's a lot of turnover and a lot of change that can happen in just a couple of years. Um, so don't hold it completely to the institution. Um, but yeah, this is one that's got a lot of small grants. So they, I got two of these grants back when I wasn't on the board for my Chief Buffalo project. Um, and that was the Anishinaabe Fund, which I think they gave me $8,000 from that. And then um, the Henry Wheeler, Henry and Sarah Wheeler Historical Awareness Fund, which was $1,000 for signage. Um, so again, thinking about like, neither of those are art grants. Um, one is for like anything that uplifts Ojibwe culture and the other one is anything that uplifts history. And so I'm using art through a history grant. Um, you could probably find what, is, there's history grants, <laughs> which is a whole nother thing that I don't have uh, listed here, but thinking about like the Minnesota Humanities Center or those humanity centers that exist across different states. Yes, um, and we'll we'll have a link of them too because they reached out and they want to partner with us. So the humanities and and this is a lot like Miri and I going forward too, um, you know, to engage with different foundations or nonprofits, even if they're not arts centric, because they will hire artists to you know, have innovative ideas and to provide um, the artwork for it, the music, the what have you. So the, the thinking outside of the box is, is really good. I didn't know this, but the Toffee Lake um, Residency and Retreat Center, they also have like, sometimes you just stumble across these. So I actually applied for this residency and I found that they had a similar list to Springboard for the Arts um, with maybe a couple extra resources <laughs> listed here. And it's like at the bottom of the residency thing. So again, um, I think that's really in the spirit of we all succeed when we all succeed because they didn't necessarily have to put that this information is here. But I think also there might be some um, programs that they have where people may be paid to stay in the space. And so they wanted to list opportunities for people to actually pay for the space um, through grants instead of out of pocket. So um, that was pretty cool. And then St. Paul and Minnesota Foundation, I believe um, they, even though they have St. Paul in the name, their mission is a just and vibrant Minnesota where all people and communities thrive, live, things like that. And so I think they actually um, might have some requests for proposals or things that letter, letters of interest and stuff like that, that um, they put a call out for. Uh, they, they funded a mural project that I have in Lincoln Park. Uh, and that was sort of just because they'd reached out to an organization up here, the American Indian Community Housing Organization. And then they were like, okay, <laughs> we will fund your project. So yeah, connect with, I guess, organizations too, like make those partnerships with organizations. And if you have an idea, like pitch it to somebody at an organization and see, you know, um, a, a trusted organization, you don't want them taking your ideas and not, you know, paying you, but uh, <laughs> and tell them a traumatized artist here, but you know, <laughs> learn from her trauma. <laughs> but definitely, you know, in, in the spirit of camaraderie and all those things, you know, make good partnerships with organizations and 
you know, ACO has been a space I used to work there and I, I left working there on good terms. And ever since, you know, they supported a lot of projects through the grants that they've received at an organizational level. So um, think outside the box, I guess, as far as, you know, where you're reaching out. Um, Cause sometimes the answers and the funding isn't necessarily just in the art world. It is everywhere. It's all around us. <laughs> <laughs> interpretive dance um and then Susanna asks are McKnight grants always connected to another organization like High Point ah oh, do we have another organ Ooh, that is a good question well we get so ARAC gets some has McKnight funding we have McKnight funding that we and maybe I may be thinking of Jerome too I that could be part of the problem or not part of the problem but I think they do like it's kind of like I don't know a lot of those bigger foundations seem to kind of have like they'll they'll pass on the 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 running the actual running of the fellowships and stuff to other institutions like the Headwaters Foundation for Justice I think receives funding from Bush Foundation to manage some of their fellowships so I think I don't know if all of the McKnight come from or partner with other places but it's definitely a practice of theirs. I see Kim has her hand up. And if you want to unmute and share your thoughts. Boy, is my arm tired. No, no, <laughs> no I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I was uh, putting hand up when you were talking about public art. Um, I know that you guys were thinking about doing a public art um, uh, grant. Is that still in the works? Or um, unfortunately, that is suspended for now um, yeah. because our our executive director had left and yep. we are, have an interim and we're on the hunt for a new, which we hope to have by July 1st. And um, that person, you know, of course, will pitch the idea that we had developed to that person, but not at least for not for the next year's cycle. And then beyond that, we have the biennial planning. So then hopefully we'll be able to incorporate that into the 24, 25 fiscal year. I have a lot of public art that I would love to do. Um, We're just, you know, up in Boavik here with the Bavarian theme and everything. I mean, I have a ton. And so I, that's why I'm tuning in tonight is to find other ways to fund public art. But like you said, it's really, it's tough. Yeah, the history grants, like if there's some component of history in your work, that's where I, I think I pulled a lot of funding. And then also there's a, um, I will go back to sharing my screen really quick. Let's see. There was a fundraising platform and I don't know how often they um, released this program, but it was called, it's called In Your Own Backyard, I-O-B, Y. Okay. Um, and what I did, let's see, uh, where, so many tabs now. <laughs> <laughs> so many tabs. So many tabs. Okay, click here to support this project. So they had a program called Artist Lead where they would match dollar per dollar. Um, like an artist could submit a proposal and then they would match dollar per dollar in almost like a GoFundMe. So like it's very it's similar similarly set up to GoFundMe where you have your your pitch and your story you have your little budget on the side you can request volunteers if you need um, it's a really cool interface and it became kind of a landing page for the the project and didn't do you know a super major ton of ton of fundraising but like when emergencies happen for the project like people would donate and IOB would again dollar per dollar. Um, match those funds so that was pretty cool that's really cool i was unfamiliar with that mary yeah see and um, this is why you all talk to one another share one other question with with the um public arts is there any way that um uh arac would be like uh put out feelers for artists to do public art uh, mm -hmm. or or where can i find a way to do a call for artists or jobs. Because we can get some IRRB money up here. IRRB can help us with some of it. Yeah. 
I think, so you're asking about putting out the actual call for art, like what? Yeah, is there a place where I can use my images? But the picture for my feed, you know, I don't know if we have to pick an artist or if we have to have a couple or, you know, what kind of music, right? Something that we have to like have several artists uh, make a little like uh, thing that the, the public gets to look at and vote on. I mean, how, since you've done public art, how, how does that typically work? Uh, your microphone kind of is cutting out a lot, but I think, you know, as far as like reaching out to artists, that submittable website is, is really cool. I've never actually set up like a call for art um, specifically for that or request for proposals that way, but I'm sure making an account there and putting that out on that space. There's a lot of artists who use that. Um, and then as far as like getting more funding, like I think, you know, businesses are often for public art, approaching businesses is really um, helpful. Like a lot of the murals okay. that I've done have not, like I have, I have a lot of issues with working with the city <laughs> or have had issues working with the city. Um, I think especially in areas out here in greater Minnesota, like the cities don't ha have really robust public arts um, anything. <laughs> so uh, it's definitely, um, we're definitely kind of building these systems ourselves. And a lot of that work falls on the artists when, when you live in greater Minnesota, unfortunately, and like educating the public on public art and then you know, if you have a public arts commission in your city, um, you know, educating them on on what processes would be helpful and, and encouraging them to be liaisons rather than, you know, deciders of like who gets to make art and gatekeepers. Yeah. yeah. But if yeah. You, like if you go to forecast public art, you can see there to yeah. sign up for their newsletter because they do offer workshops for that kind of thing. OK. Um, they also will do, um, and I know Springboard for the Arts also, where they do consults. So they'll like spend an hour with you and they have like a, a sliding scale fee. But um, I think you told me about this before. Mm -hmm. I think you told me about this before. So yeah, and they actually will come up and you, you can engage them because like I know they did a plan for the city of Duluth at one point. So you uh -huh see if what it takes i'm not sure sure what all goes into that two or, harbors too didn't you tell me that they worked with two, two harbors? harbors got through yep. they got a main street yep um so yeah i mean so when you start looking at that um unfortunately you know we don't have a lot of funding up here so you have to look towards yeah. those metros but you know, they've been shown because we talk a lot about equity and, and part of our equity, too, is metro versus rural. And even yeah. like Duluth is considered a metro, but we spread our money over the seven counties. We we take those things into consideration. Sometimes Duluth can't even be part of our grants. So, um, you know, it's really important to us to get out to the corners and the places, you know, because there is such amazing talent in our region. It's just mind blowing. And yeah. you shouldn't have to live in a specific place in order to benefit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I drive down my main street and it's just a, it's a blank canvas. <laughs> I see so much hope for it, you know, it's like, oh God, if I was, uh, you know, um, what's his name? I, whatever. But yeah. So, okay, well, thank you very much for answering my question. I appreciate it very much. And I'm looking forward to the public art uh, one that's in a couple weeks. Yeah, try and compile some <laughs> some <laughs> stories and, and stuff for that. Um, and also, like, yeah, definitely check out the Forecast Public Arts website because they also, I think, have toolkits too. So, like, if, if there's something missing as far as resources in your community, I feel like I've seen um, toolkits for how to get those started. But again, I do, uh, yeah, it, it does suck that a lot of the work really falls on artists and, and organizers out here to do a lot of sort of volunteer labor before 
change happens. <laughs> I feel like when I did the Chief Buffalo Project, and I'll probably talk about that in the public art thing, but it was, it basically has been a full-time job for me in the last couple of years. And between like the grant writing that goes into it and then managing all of those different sources of funding, managing the artists and figuring out travel and making sure people get paid, marketing, power washing, all this stuff. <laughs> um, and I wish, you know, like that project in a bigger city would probably be a hundred thousand dollar project. And here I was happy to pull together $50,000 from a multitude of different sources. So, um, and half of that came from, again, ACO, who had another grant through the Bush Foundation. So making sure, again, try and connect with those organizations who are already getting funding for doing um, community engaged stuff. And there's a lot of ways to, to pivot public art into community engaged social service type things, which there is fun. Okay. So, um, Serenity S, has anyone here tried to kickstart a campaign? Do you think crowdfunding is a good option for funding as artists? Uh, I, the Kickstarter scares me because it's like people donate and then if it doesn't succeed, then the money goes back to uh, everybody. So I have preferred GoFundMe. Um, I've only really had success on like immediate costs. So like for the Chief Buffalo Project, um, the paint was delivered and stolen. <laughs> and oh, so it was like $400, $500 worth of paint that I had delivered to a friend's house because I can't get mail in my building <laughs> that's larger than a certain size. And it got mailed to the friend's house and I thought it would be safe there and somebody took it off of her porch. And so when I had that immediate need, like the community, like no problem, stepped up, like chipped in, we bought paint, we figured out a way to get it like ASAP to me instead of waiting for shipping again. And we also had the issues of like the specific paint I used, the mural paint um, would break a when it was delivered, it was like the best paint ever, but you couldn't buy it locally. And so I had to have it shipped. And I actually had to reach out to the company and be like, your paint cannot be transported. <laughs> so help. Um, <laughs> and so definitely for immediate needs, I think it's, at least for me, it's been really easy to just have people help out. Like even I had a, a GoFundMe for a car and that's how I got my car. <laughs> um, <Did you? laughs> my beautiful Buick Enclave was a product of like two, three, four thousand dollars of fundraising that people just were like, I, I want to support you being able to, you know, drive back and forth and pick up those supplies or deliver mural supplies to the actual site because I couldn't fit everything in the little car that I had before. Um, and so people were just really cool and donated. So um, having those stories too, like community connections and um, immediate needs definitely works. I don't know so much for the long-term crowdfunding, like you saw the IOB thing, um, even though that was dollar for do dollar, that was only, I feel like they actually got more from that, but you know, it was a total of like $3,000 that turned up in the end. So I think about $1,500 in individual donations. Um, and I think I had 30 people or so donate of like anywhere from five to $500. So um, kind of a shot in the dark as far as that. But I would recommend places that let you keep the money at the end, even if there's, it, there is a larger service fee, <laughs> because <laughs> I just don't think it's, you know, the purpose of like Kickstarter and stuff like that is to really like create that campaign and that immediate excitement, but I don't think it works as well in smaller towns or places that don't have like a, a ton of people who are able to contribute. Um, and then what else was I going to say? There's a website called, let's see if it still exists. The only one that was kind of like Kickstart that I actually really enjoyed was uh, share screen bonfire. Um, and so you can design like t-shirts uh, and they will, let's see if I can find it. Boy. Mm, oh, there it is. So I did this um, t-shirt campaign for um, a fellow artist of mine. 
fellow artist, fellow friend, fellow somebody. Um, and you design a shirt basically, and it's print on demand basically. Um, and I think I did this for that concert series too, actually. And they're actually really nice quality shirts. I really, really like the, the materials that they use. And you can set the price for however you want. And they basically just take the printing cost. But the trick is you have to sell 15 um, or like a certain percentage of the goal of shirts um, before it will lock it in, lock in everybody's donations and people will be able to receive their shirts and stuff. So it's kind of like Kickstarter, but with like a, um, a component of merchandise uh that people will get and you actually don't have to manage like mailing it to anybody like it's just automatic once you hit that threshold everybody's shirts goes out and um i think you can only run these for 30 days so uh it's still got the elements of like this is a campaign you better you know work really hard and <laughs> sell these shirts um but yeah obviously i mean it made like 140 bucks or whatever and i think it it shares like you know this is Let's see, 14 sold at 26. I don't know math, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> math. I don't know if that was like the amount I made or the amount that <laughs> sold. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, Susanna had asked if there's a public arts commission in Duluth and kind of answered in the chat. There is, but they, up until this point, up until the Chief Buffalo project, they hadn't ever worked with a muralist before. So there may be public arts commissions in your cities, but they might be specialized to more like, you know, touristy things like sculptures or like stuff that's more tangible rather than like artistic, like artistic in the fun, messy, community engaged way. Um, yeah. Dang it, we've been so over time <laughs> with the questions every time. Well. That happens when I do independent ones every time, but that that's good. We have engaged people. We have lots to say, and this is a lot of information coming at you um, at once and a ton of resources. And um, I think it's awesome. I am a big fan of the resources. So, and you learn so much you, you, as you go through, you'll see languages and you know, and it's really interesting. Other question, would you ever do workshop stream talking about how you create murals and stuff? Eventually, the Chief Buffalo Project has one more round of um, everything to do this year because there was a whole process of, so we're in working with the city, there was this maintenance agreement thing that the city had never done a maintenance agreement with a muralist before, and so, <laughs> they kind of pushed my ability to paint last year um, up until August. And I'll probably share that all kind of in the public art things, TBH. But basically, obviously in August, like you get one hot month and then it's cold. And so we couldn't paint. And so we're going back in the summer, um, actually next month to finish. And there will be a lot of social media and fun with that. Oh yeah, Sylvia's here. Sylvia's one of our artists. <laughs> she said, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so Sylvia was one of the artists and we she's in Turtle Mountain um, out in North Dakota. And so her and the other artist, Elena Gijek, would drive like 19 hours every weekend to come and paint because the city pushed the deadline into Elena Gijek's school year, basically. And so I had the artist for the summer obviously fall other things happen and so it was <laughs> a lot of stuff yeah uh yes and then as far as like contact i'm gonna throw my email in the thing and holly you can throw yours in too um but yeah is there any other questions or thoughts or Type coming in 15 minutes. <laughs> you are a busy gal. Okay. 
And with that, should we conclude? Thank you everyone for coming. Um, and we, like she showed you, we have under our resources tab, we now have a workshops. So these are recorded and then we post them there after. Great, I'm gonna stop the recording. Bye people watching.